Good morning. My name is Pat Lichtman, and I serve on the board of the DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church. I am a trustee of spirituality, which includes Sunday services, adult enrichment, youth RE, the music committee, and several others. Um, we want to welcome everyone to our open and inclusive community. As Unitarian Universalists, we hold that there are many spiritual paths to truth and meaning. And we support one another as we explore these paths. First time in returning visitors, it is our custom to invite you to stand and give your name and where you are from, if you feel comfortable doing so. Are there any visitors today? Welcome, welcome. Oh, very nice. Others, visitors today. Welcome to everyone visiting today. Please join us after the service for coffee hour. We would love to have a chance to get to know you better. I will be there along with other members of our church and in addition, Reverend Mike Walker and our religious director, religious education director, Steve Cooper. Um, in addition, if you are uh, visiting today, we invite you um, after the service, um, which can be a little, um, after the service, it's a little crowded in Creeves Hall. So if you would like to have coffee with one of our members, please join us in the annex, which is just below the sanctuary. You'll see the staircase as you go to the right. For those of you who are, um, our service can be heard outside the glass doors at the back of the sanctuary should anyone feel the need to step out of the service for any reason. As we begin our service, please silence all electronic devices. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. This morning we will light our chalice in recognition of the natural world, the source of all, and for everything that fills us with a sense of awe. Just outside among all the trees and green life stands the Cathedral of Nature, awesome and magnificent. We humans have a responsibility for this planet. We are the stewards of the earth, not the dominators, but the stewards. Let us keep the wilds pristine and beautiful as a sacred space encompassing the globe for nature is the source of all, including us. May we find awe in all of this. Blessed be. I'd like to invite up a couple of people. For every person, there comes a time when they cease to be passive recipients of their traditions that their parents and teachers <laughs> seek to hand on to them. When they become active participants themselves in their commitment to discovering the meaning of their heritage. Each year, I invite students to claim the tradition of Unitarian Universalism 
for themselves by becoming chalice lighters. These young people spend time with their parents and with each other thinking about the meaning of the flaming chalice and about the purposes and principles of the Unitarian Universalist Association. This morning, we're gonna recognize Eleanor Hobbs and Lucinda Knight as we invite them into a more active role in the worship life of our congregation. These youth will be joining a group of their peers that help open the service each Sunday morning by lighting the chalice for us. Today, they will light the chalice and each will recite one of the Unitarian Universalist principles that is especially meaningful for them. We light our chalice this morning in respect for the independent web of all existence of which we are a part. We light our chalice this morning for the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Eleanor and Lucinda, we name you chalice lighters here in our congregation. Know that we rejoice in you because you are the future of our faith. Remember that you represent the living tradition of Unitarian Universalism and strive to live with courage, honesty, and hope in all that you do. Let your heart be loving, compassionate to others, and grateful for all that the world holds. Carry in your spirit the flame that you lit today. May the light of truth always help you find your way. May the warmth of community nurture and restore you. And may the fire of commitment burn within you for all that is good, just, and true. May it ever be so, and blessed be you both. Welcome. I invite you to join us in reciting the words of our affirmation, which you can see on the screen. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to see the truth in love, and to help out one another. Our opening hymn is number 175. We celebrate the web of life, and Kelly is going to be kind enough to help us if we don't know it. It is time to gather. I would like to invite all the young and young at heart to come forward and join us on the gathering quilt as Reverend Mike and I share a story with you.
How are you all doing this morning? Good. Okay. Good. So this month, our new theme is awe. And what it means to be a people of awe. And today we have a story that speaks of awe by a bird baler called I, I'm in Charge of Celebrations. So Bird lives in the southwest United States where most of the land is desert. And she, as she was growing up, she was awed by many of the things that she found in the desert. And she wanted to remember these moments, so she created celebrations. And here is the story. Sometimes people ask me, aren't you lonely out there with just desert around you? I guess they mean the bear grass and the yuccas and the cactus and the rocks. I guess they mean the deep ravines and the hawk nests and the cliffs and the coyote trails that wind across the hills. Lonely? I can't help laughing when they ask me that. I always look at them surprised. And I say, how could I be lonely? I'm the one in charge of celebrations. Sometimes they don't believe me, but it's true. I am. I put myself in charge. I choose my own way. Last year, I gave myself 108 celebrations, besides the ones they closed school for. I cannot get by with only a few. Friend, I'll tell you how it works. I keep a notebook, and I write the date, and then I write about the celebration. I'm very choosy over what goes in that book, it has to be something I plan to remember the rest of my life. You can tell what's worth a celebration because your heart will pound and you will feel like you're standing on top of the mountain and you'll catch your breath like you were breathing some new kind of air. Otherwise, I count it as just an average day. I told you I was choosy. Friend, I wish you had been there for the dust devil day. But since you weren't, I'll tell you how it got to be my first real celebration. You can call it the whirlwinds if you want to. Me, I think dust devils has a better sound. Well, anyway, I always stop to watch them. Here, everyone does. You know how they come from far away, moving up from the flats, swirling and swaying and falling and turning, picking up picking up sticks and sand and feathers and dry tumbleweeds. Well, last March 11th, we were all going somewhere, and I was in the back of a pickup truck when the dust devils started to gather. You could see they were giants. You'd swear they were calling their friends to come too, and they came, dancing in time to their own windy music. We all started counting, we all started looking for more. And they stopped that truck and we turned around and around watching them all. There were seven. At a, time, at a time like that, something goes kind of crazy in you. You have to run to meet them, yelling all the way. You have to whirl around like you were one of them and you can't stop until you're falling down. And then, all day, you think how lucky you were to be there. Some of my best celebrations are sudden surprises like that. If you weren't outside at that exact moment, you'd miss them. I spend a lot of time outside myself, looking around. Once, I saw a triple rainbow that ended in a canyon where I'd been the day before. I was halfway up a hill, standing in a drizzle of rain. It was almost dark, but I wouldn't go in because of the rainbows, of course. And there, at the top of a hill, a jackrabbit was standing up on its hind legs, perfectly still, looking straight at the same triple rainbow. I may be the only person in the world who's seen a rabbit stand in the mist, quietly watching three rainbows. That's worth a celebration any time. I rode it down and drew the hill and the rabbit and the rainbow and me. Now, August 9th, is Rainbow Celebration Day. I have Green Cloud Day. 
Ask anybody, and they'll tell you clouds aren't green. But late one afternoon in the winter, I saw this huge green cloud. It was not bluish green or grayish green or something else. The, this cloud was green, green as a jungle parrot. And the strange thing was that it began to take a parrot's shape. First the wings and then the head and beak. High in the winter sky, that green bird flew. It didn't last more than a minute. You know how fast a cloud can change, but I still remember how it looked. So I celebrate green clouds on February 6th. At times like that, I always think, what if I'd missed it? What if I'd been in the house? Or what if I hadn't looked up when I did? You can see I'm very lucky about things like that. And I was lucky on Coyote Day because out of all time it had to be the one moment only that a certain coyote and I could meet, and we did. <coughs> Friend, you should have been there too. I was following deer tracks, taking my time, bending down as I walked, kind of humming. I hum a lot when I'm alone. I looked up in time to see a young coyote trotting through the brush. She crossed in front of me. It was a windy day, and she was going east. In that easy, silent way coyotes move, she pushed into the wind. I stood there, hardly breathing, wish I could move that way. I was surprised to see her stop and turn and look at me. She seemed to think that I was just another creature following another rocky trail. And that's true, of course, I am. She didn't hurry. She wasn't afraid. I saw her eye and she saw mine. That look held us together. Because of that, I will never feel quite the same again. So on September 28th, I celebrate Coyote Day. Here's what I do. I walk the trail I walked that day, and I hum softly as I go. Finally, I unwrap the feast I brought for her. Last time, it was three apples and some pumpkin seeds and an ear of corn and some big, soft, homemade ginger cookies. The next day, I happened to pass that way again. Coyote tracks went all around the rock where the food had been, and the food was gone. Next year, I'll make it even better. I'll bring an extra feast and eat there too. Another one of my greatest of all celebrations is called the Time of Falling Stars. It lasts almost a week in the middle of August, and I wait all year for those hot summer nights when the sky goes wild. You can call them meteor showers if you want to, me, I like to say they're falling stars. All that week, I sleep outside. I give my full attention to the sky. And every time a streak of light goes shooting through the darkness, I feel my heart shoot out of me. One night, I saw a fireball that left a long red blazing trail across the sky. After it was gone, I stood there looking up, not quite believing what I had seen. The strange thing was, I met a man who told me he had seen it too while he was lying by a campfire 500 miles away. He said he did not sleep again that night. Suddenly, it seemed that we two spoke a language no one else could understand. So every August of my life, I think of that. <clears throat> Friend, I've saved my New Year celebration until last. Mine is a little different from the one most people have. It comes in the spring. To tell the truth, I never did feel like my New Year started January 1st. To me, that's just another winter day. I let my year begin when winter ends and morning light comes earlier, the way it should. That's when I feel like starting new. I wait until the white-winged doves are back from Mexico and wildflowers cover the hills and my favorite cactus blooms. It always makes me think I ought to bloom myself. 
And that's when I start to plan my New Year celebration. I finally choose a day that's exactly right. Even the air has to be perfect and the dirt has to feel good and warm on bare feet. Usually it's a Saturday around the end of April. I have a drum that I beat to signal the day. Then I go wandering off, following all of my favorite trails to all of the places I like. I check how everything is doing. I spend the day admiring things. If the old tortoise I know from last year is out strolling around, I'll go his direction a while. I celebrate with horned toads and ravens and lizards and quail. And friend, it's not a bad party. Walking back home, kind of humming, sometimes I think about those people who ask me if I'm lonely here. I have to laugh out loud. Wow. So if I was in charge of celebrations, one of my favorite events would be the morning after a foggy or misty night when it's freezing outside. At first, it looks like it snowed on everything, but upon a closer look, you realize that you see each individual blade of grass and every twig on the tree. So it's, and it's not just a thin layer of frost, I'm talking about what's called a hoarfrost, which happens when water vapor goes straight from, go uh, from a gas to a solid form. So everything becomes covered with great big crystals of frozen water. Power lines become white lines across the sky. And if it's a bright and sunny day, it looks like the whole world is made out of glass. What awesome events can you think of that you would like to create a celebration for? Can you think of anything? Can you think of anything that you would like to create a celebration for that you might see? When a flower is blooming, like maybe that first daffodil in the spring, you create a celebration. What's that, Kate? Crunchy leaves. Crunchy leaves. Yes, when all over and you just step on them. So when you're walking through a wooded area and you're walking through the leaves and they're crunching and making all those noises. Yes, Caroline. The first robin. The first robin of spring. That's a celebration. We have somebody right here. Sasha. So when the moon looks yellowish orange. Right in the middle of the fall and winter, she said. Yeah. What else would you celebrate? <coughs> Ellie. Like, uh, all the frost is covering everything. When the frost is covering everything. Yes. So maybe something you can do. Did you have any thoughts, Mike? I had one. Okay. So one place that I went to that a uh, few times that I would celebrate is a place called Silver Falls in Oregon. And it's a park that has, a, I think, seven or eight different waterfalls. And one of them starts way up high, and it comes down to a pool way far below. And the trail that goes up to it is kind of in the middle. And it goes into this giant cavern behind the waterfall, so you can be on the inside watching all of it come down. It's very pretty. So maybe you can create your own celebration, start a journal, and you can either draw pictures to represent that celebration or write words to explain it and tell about your experiences. So let's all stand and body our spirit. And let's sing hymn number 352, Find a Stillness, while everyone returns to their chairs.
hollow bones, streamlined feathers and wings shaped to push aside the viscosity of air are not what make birds fly. Birds let go of their grasp on safe perches at the tops of trees because something calls to them. They unfold their untried wings and feel an unimagined power. They soar out and up and through the winter sky because an ancient longing pulls them home. <coughs> Loosed from the sticky grasp of earth, free from the snarls of lesser creatures with daggers in their teeth and muscles in their legs, birds laugh upwards, homeward, drawn by a calling which bids them welcome in the sky. Bird, take me with you when you go. Oh, no, no, not my lumbering body and knitted tissue, no. Take some other me with, me with you, some invisible soul of me that hears the call you hear, that moves effortlessly with you through the bright pink silk of dawn and the warm butter spread of morning. Carry my longing to be weightless, to move as light moves, to be unseen, scattered through time and space. Teach me to trust my wings. Blessed be. Back in the late 1980s, when I was in college, I worked on a project that was awe-inspiring at the time. There are still some aspects to it that give me awe yet today. I'll give you a quick overview of what we were doing and then a story that I'd like to share about the power of technology and the awe of being with people of power. So I'm at one of the small University of Wisconsin schools in Platteville, Wisconsin. It's in the southwest corner of Wisconsin. And I was there for electrical engineering and computer science. In the recent years, there had been some mid-air collisions between airplanes and a lot of near misses. Most occurrences involved miscommunication between air traffic control and the cockpit. So a communications professor at Uni University of Wisconsin had this idea to use off-the-shelf equipment and current technology at the time to create an aircraft collision avoidance system. This would put a display in the cockpit that allows the pilot to see what aircraft is in the vicinity. And we wanted it to be cheap so that, or at least cheap enough so that general aviation planes, regular pi private pilots could add these to their airplanes and be able to subscribe to the data stream of air traffic. So the idea was to take actual radar data and send it through a satellite link to the airplane computer, which is connected to the airplane's GPS, and all the planes would show up on a moving map in which a couple classmates and I would write the software. It sounds easy today. <laughs> but it was 1989, and none of this existed. We got a grant from the Department of Defense for research and development. Now, you've probably seen Snyder trucking trucks on the highway, 
And back in the 80s, each truck had lo what looked like a casserole dish on top of the cab. This casserole dish had inside of it a tracking antenna that as the truck would maneuver and turn, there's this little taco shell shaped antenna inside of it that would rotate around and follow a particular satellite. So the trucking company used these to communicate to all their truckers across the nation because there's no other way to do it. We didn't have cell phones, or at least cell phones that were affordable. So this was the first uh, form of texting because they were able to send messages to each other, but it would go through the satellite. So we mounted one of these casserole dishes on our airplane. Now, our professor had a tremendous bartering skill, and he managed to get us access to the radars at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And there was a company that started building a device that turned radar data into a digital stream, because at that point it was just all analog. It was just blips on a screen. So we hooked up our super fast 9600 baud modem, <laughs> which we dialed into from Golden, Colorado, which is where the satellite transmitter was. And we sent the data up to the satellite, which would then come back down to our plane in southwest Wisconsin. This allowed us to do proof of concept until one day when we would actually go to Edwards Air Force Base and try it out in real life. So as you would imagine, we had a super high-end portable computer to manage all the data, computations, and graphics. Ah, but remember, it was 1989. Laptops and small, light computers did not exist yet. At least none that were attainable. So we had a 50-pound IBM PS2 <laughs> Model 30 286. Added to that, we also had a car battery and a power inverter that we also carried into the plane because the plane didn't have 110 volts to supply power to run the computer. So I have a short video that was from one of the Madison, Wisconsin television networks doing a news article on the project. The quality is not great because this is captured from a 30-year-old VHS tape. But I think it'll help you envision what all was entailed. And you can see me back when my beard wasn't white. <laughs> no sound. So our birds in southwest Wisconsin. So this is our pilot, David Stoffaker. He, uh, he had his own plane, and he volunteered his time and his plane to do this. So that's his plane. That's our power pile of equipment. There's a casserole dish. We mounted it onto the manif manifold of the uh, airplane. There's some of the equipment. There's our PS2. That's the display that the pilot would see. So the Piper Malibu that we flew, that's the professor there. The Malibu, Malibu that we flew had six seats. So the pilot, co-pilot, and then two seat, or four seats in the back, two of them facing each other. So I'm doing, since I'm the one doing demos, I'm always the one sitting backwards, flying backwards, demoing it to people. So I have no problem riding trains backwards or cars backwards or anything like that anymore because this, this trained me to, to be able to handle movement in the rear direction. So through this project, I worked in some pretty awesome places, such as air traffic control at Edwards Air Force Base, in the control tower at O'Hare, uh, <clears throat> the control centers in Elgin and Aurora, and I've also worked side by side with some pretty awesome people, such as Bert Rutan, who was famous for creating record-breaking aircraft, and he created the first privately funded spacecraft and won the X Prize. And Mike Melville, who was Burt Rutan's test pilot, and he piloted the spacecraft. 
I worked in their hangar for a few days as we prepped for our Edwards Air Force Base test. So this is all pretty awesome, but the following story is an event that created the most awe for me. It was a foggy Friday morning in the spring, and I had a test for one of my classes at noon. But we had a demo scheduled with Bill Cotton, the safety officer and number two person at, for United Airlines. Our pilot picked him up at an airport in Chicago while we prepared for their arrival at the Platteville Airport, hoping the fog would clear because it was an uncontrolled airport, meaning that there's no one to direct you or warn you about other planes. The pilot contacted us before leaving Chicago, and we decided that the fog would not have lifted before they arrive. However, a half hour away in Dubuque, Iowa, the weather was clear, so we decided to meet there. One of my classmates went with me to Dubuque to set up and then he would drive my truck back to Platteville, um, assuming that the fog will have lifted by the time that we're done with our demo, and then I would be able to drive to campus and take my test. Everything worked out as expected. The, the demo went well. Ironically, at the time, though, we were demoing real-time weather in the cockpit rather than air traffic data. And when we flew to Platteville to drop me off and unload the equipment, the airport was still fogged in. And without air traffic control, it was too dangerous to try landing. I think Bill Cotton felt sorry for me. Knowing that I had a test in less than an hour and that I would be stranded if we were to take me back to Dubuque. So he got on the radio and called O'Hare Traffic Control. He identified himself and said he was in a private plane trying to land in southwest Wisconsin. He gave them the ID number we were sending out and asked if they could see us on the radar and if so, would they guide us into the airport and land us. They could and they did. So I packed up the equipment, gave my gratitude to Bill Cotton and our pilot and drove to campus and took my test. Upon later reflection, I, become, I became awed not only by what technology can allow you to do, but how people with the power, with the right power and pull can use that technology with compassion and grace. So technology does give us the power to create awe and wonder. However, once upon a time, most folks use the offering plate to fulfill their pledges of financial support. Nowadays, lots of folks click on their church website or set up automatic transfers from their checking accounts. Some still write a monthly check paying their church bill along with all the others. But passing the offering plate was never just practical exercise. It has always been a ritual. Even if your pledge is paid up, it is worthwhile for you to bring even just a dollar to drop in, into the plate as a ritual reminder of the form of love we call generosity. Let it be a reminder that after meeting our obligations to ourselves and our households and the communities to which we belong and are committed, we must still keep our capacity to give. The practice of giving until it is second nature and first response helps bring forth the realm of love. The offering will now be given and gracefully received.
In gratitude for the generosity of this com community, I invite you to all join me in saying together, thank you. Steve talked a bit about the awe he has experienced with technology and power. I'm going to talk about the awe I've experienced in nature. I'm sure many of us have stories about experiencing awe while out in nature, of times we were walking in the woods, hiking up a mountain trail, or watching the sunset over the ocean. Many of us can speak of feeling part of something greater, something huge and magnificent beyond our full comprehension when we are there out in nature. I have many such stories myself, but I would like to share one that has always evoked in me a sense of, a sense of awe which I still feel today. Twenty years ago, I was on active duty in the Navy, and I had a three-year assignment providing medical care to Marines when I and about a thousand of my closest friends were deployed to Okinawa, Japan, where we all lived together on the edge of the jungle for about half a year. I had a buddy named Jenner who was, was kind of like my little brother I had adopted. We decided while we lived on this little semi-tropical island far out in the Pacific Ocean, we would learn to scuba dive. It may be hard to imagine, but at one time I was a certified diver. Jenner and I and a group of divers went off to Maeda Beach one day in the late afternoon. During our first dive of the day, we explored the coral reef heading east and south from the beach. That day, Jenner and I followed an octopus through an underwater cavern, and we saw little uh, tunicates that look like Christmas trees fluttering in the current until you get too close to them, and then pop, they disappear into a hole. We saw nudibranchs, gorgeous orange and yellow, blue and pink sea creatures fluttering along and if you had not known better, we would have had no idea that they were relatives of the common garden slug. Evolution has done amazing things below the waves. We also saw very beautiful and dangerous sea stars called crown of thorns. Unlike other starfish you have probably seen, this is a gigantic bright green star filled Skin is covered with sharp barbs. Like many things in the ocean, it is poisonous. It also likes to eat coral reefs, and so they are dangerous to the environment. But they have a predator, a beautiful mollusk with a mottled golden brown spiral shell that can grow to be about two feet long. Unfortunately, poachers love these beautiful shells and sell them for over 5,000 yen, which is around $50 or so. For this reason, many divers use their diving knives to snap off the tip of the shell. The poachers would not want it then, and it actually does no harm to the mollusk inside the shell. Most importantly, though, this leaves the mollusk to live another day to hunt the crown of thorns, thereby saving the coral reefs. The natural world is fascinating. Later that same day, we and the other divers took a break on the beach and watched the sun go down. After dark, we went as a group for another dive. This time, we swam out and headed north of the beach along an underwater cliff wall, which goes down around 160 feet, although we went less than halfway down. There were six of us, and we all swam together with our headlamps on, lighting the way until we found the cliff wall, and we dove deeper. For this dive, we were going to go down to around 70 feet below the surface. We gathered at a spot along the cliff wall at about 20 feet under, and then we turned off all of our headlamps, and we slowly sank down along the cliff wall in the dark. Down, down, past 25 feet, past 30 feet, and down some more. As we slowly let off ballast so we would sink, we noticed something about the quality of the darkness around us. Between 30 and 70 feet we saw, even though we had turned off our lights and it was nighttime, it was not dark. 
We hadn't been able to see this phenomenon closer to the surface or before the lamps were turned off, but now we saw we were surrounded by phosphorescent and fluorescent life forms. <clears throat> I'm going to go on a segue here and then come back to my story. Have any of you seen the James Cameron science fiction movie Avatar? Some, yeah? Okay. So Cameron is a diver also, and in fact in the movie he had several land-dwelling life forms that were patterned after real-life earth life forms from our oceans, such as the creatures when when the main character of the movie got close to them, zipped down and disappeared into a hole, just like the Christmas tree tunicates. Also, some may recall from the movie a sense of wonder as the main character was finally able to see through the eyes of the native, native people and the whole world began to glow in the dark. Well, that is what it's like, about 30 to 70 feet below the surface of the ocean at least in the tropical waters of Okinawa. My diver friends and I all just hovered there for the longest time, once we found ourselves surrounded by millions of little glowing creatures flitting around here and there. The wall of the cliff glowed with phosphorescent plants and animals of all different colors, like an old light bright toy. At around 70 feet below, we found ourselves hovering within a cloud of living light, which was an experience unlike any I'd ever had in my life before or since. A cloud of living light evoked in me a sense of awe at the sheer wonder of the world. In parts of the world, most of us don't see very often, if ever, this was an experience Jenner and I talked about for years after. It was almost beyond the ability of words to express, and I'm afraid I don't do justice to the experience now, as I find it difficult to find words to describe this scene of indescribable beauty, a cloud of living light, of which, for a short time, we humans got to be a part. Okay, so I won't say that I met God below the surface of the sea, but I had an experience of the natural world which gave me a deep, visceral appreciation for the interdependent web of life. In other words, I experienced a sense of awe which has been difficult to capture in words. The coral reefs are living colonies of creatures upon which other creatures depend for shelter or food, and still other creatures protect the reef from predators. I saw plants which looked alien and colorful nudibranchs which were a thousand times prettier than their garden slug cousins. I was touched by the simple and conscientious efforts of many divers breaking the tips of the shell of a mollusk that protects the reef from a ravenous sea star. By breaking the tips of the shells, they did no damage to the mollusk, but saved them from poachers. Science can explain so many of the mysteries of the deep, and yet scientific explanations, while in interesting, fall short of explaining the feelings one has when finding oneself surrounded by a cloud of living light, 70 feet below the surface of a nighttime ocean. Sure, there are creatures looking for mates, others hunting for food, many of them glowing to attract interest for many different reasons. I realized that this was a web of life which can be seen clearly and yet is hidden from the view of most people. I saw so much awesomeness I would have never known had existed if I had never ventured down there. I had a transcendent experience in a cloud of living life realizing we are part of something wonderful. The experience of awe a visceral and unexpected feeling that sets us back and makes us pay attention is a rare occurrence in our lives. When you find yourself surrounded by indescribable beauty and feel overwhelmed by the awesomeness of the world, take time to savor the experience. Blessed be. I'd like to invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing Blue Boat Home.
A cloud of living light, just as the mighty host of witnesses from religions long past hold us in their sight, hold us together, remind us that we are part of something so much greater than ourselves alone. Let us take this sense of interconnectedness with us in our work and play, being ever mindful of all that we are. Let us build relationships of care, caring for all parts of our ecosystem, including our humans, our families, and all. Let us celebrate and honor all of life together. Blessed be, and go now in peace. <laughs>